Bendito sea el Señor, que perdona todo pecado. Y bendito sea el Señor, que Confesemos nuestros pecados contra Dios y nuestro prójimo. Dios de misericordia, confesamos que hemos pecado contra ti en el pensamiento de tus palabras y acciones, por lo que eres mi Señor, por lo que eres mi Padre y mi no queremos amado de todo el corazón, no hemos amado a tu prójimo como a nosotros mismos, sin ser de ti. Dios Todopoderoso, tenga misericordia de ustedes. Perdone todos sus pecados por Jesucristo nuestro Señor, les fortalezca en toda bondad y por el poder del Espíritu Santo les guarde en la vida eterna. Amén. Amén. por el Espíritu, para ser tentado por Satanás. Apresúrate a socorrer, a socorrer a los que somos atacados por múltiples tentaciones. Y así como tú conoces las flaquezas de cada uno de nosotros, haz que cada uno te halle poderoso para salvar. Por Jesucristo tu Hijo, nuestro Señor, que vive y reina contigo y el Espíritu Santo. Un solo Dios, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Amén. Busquen al Señor mientras puedan encontrarlo. Sabiendo mientras está cerca, que el lado deje su camino, que el perverso deje sus ideas, vuélvanse al Señor, y Él tendrá compasión de ustedes. Vuélvanse a nuestro Dios, que es generoso para perdonar. Porque mis ideas no son como las de ustedes. Y mi manera de actuar no es como la suya. Así, como el cielo está por encima de la tierra, así también mis ideas y mi manera de actuar están por encima de las ustedes. El Señor lo afirma. Así como la lluvia y la nieve bajan del cielo y no vuelvan allá, sino que empapan la tierra. La fecundan y la hacen caminar, y producen la semilla para sembrar, y el pan para comer. Así también la palabra que sale de mis labios no vuelve a mí sin producir efecto, sino que hace lo que yo quiero y cumple la orden que le, le doy. Palabra del Señor. They will pray a portion of Psalm 34, found on page 628 of your prayer book. We'll do it antiphonally, starting with this side. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to root out our reverence to them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them, and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the broken heart, and will save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. He will keep safe all his bones. 
not one of them shall be broken. The evil shall stay the wicked, and those who make the righteous will be punished. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and none will be punished through trusting in him. And in fact, he is first called 
the slayer of ten thousands, which leads him to fear for his life in the presence of the king of God, who, with whom he seeks refuge. This king is the piece of the story that is interesting, because which king he seeks refuge with is not quite clear. On this specific point, the psalm's content presents us with a problem. The name of the king calls into question the words that are used in the linking of the psalm back to the scripture, the story that is referred to in the psalm. To bottom line it, it could be that God swooped in and saved David, or it could be that by acting and saying and ruling, David saved himself. So David is either grateful to God for his saving power by faith, or he has himself to thank because he changed his demeanor in that moment and was saved. Maybe this is splitting hairs in the translation, but for scholars it's an important point because it makes a difference in how the text is used and in what it means historically and practically for Jewish use. Was it David's changed demeanor rather than faith that saved him? And without going farther into the weeds, because I am not a Bible scholar, let me say that the issue about its origin guides which purpose is taken as dominant, because there are twin notes in this psalm of both thanksgiving and of instruction. Which kind of teaching this is matters, not just because of how it's used in the temple, because it means quite literally the difference between salvation and damnation. For us practically today, the question is a more practical one. If we are to simply hang on faith for God to deliver us, then when does it come? How and where and for how long do we wait in faith? How quickly can we expect it? Because David makes it seem really swift and simple. It is nearly instantaneous in his predicament that things change and he is set free. But I can tell you the deliverance of the Diocese of Texas seniors has not seemed so swift, and they are indeed feigning insanity. <laughs> so if it is demeanor, then how do we roll that out a little faster? Simple faith or change in demeanor, that's what we're presented with. Salvation or damnation, that is what we're presented with. That's what it comes down to. And as Auden says in the poem, even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course. And I've got to tell you, I'm not sure if I'm rooting on any given day for salvation or for condemnation of those who do evil. I mean, if I'm being honest. And I wonder who David was rooting for. Or which David was rooting for, I should say. When I read the letter from Governor Abbott, they raining suffering down on our most vulnerable teens, and I see children's hospital as to stop hormone treatments for those who are getting them, causing pain and unnecessary suffering for people in the very midst of affirming who they are, I wonder how we get to the place of salvation for the righteous. When does it come, Lord? And I think more about retribution and condemnation. And when I see people leaving their homes in Ukraine, I see mothers with babies and pets and kills on the road, and I wonder how they're holding on to hope for their return. Mm -hmm. And I see husbands that are left to fight, and I hear grandmothers making Molotov cocktails, and I wonder, where is God for them? Should they be changing their demeanor? And are they acting in faith? Is it faith that David is showing us, or is it a reassurance that we can trust God will take care of those who are actively doing evil to God's holy and faithful people? And I wonder, when I look at this writing, this psalm, if it was indeed an accident of the scribe, which is what scholars suggest, or if it was intentionally and competitively vague in its wording. Maybe the Spirit worked through the ages and nuanced this passage in a way that allows it to speak more clearly. 
to the human way in which we approach our faith, our God, and the very action and presence with which we experience our own salvation. Perhaps it isn't one or the other that David is commending to us. Perhaps it's both. Perhaps there is a deeper truth and understanding that we most, must both trust in God's saving power and in God's ability to banish those who cause suffering to the righteous forever. In other words, maybe both are true. Whether or not there's a translational editorial mistake in the psalm, maybe it is there because both can be true together. Of course they can. We know they can. We live that they can. David is wise to speak of the physical presence in this psalm. This is where taste and see comes from, the beginning of this psalm. And it is about his physical presence. He is astute when he talks of the physical parts of suffering and of fear. The fear that David experienced was physical. It has an acrid taste of fear. You can hear it in your ears. What you experience is physical. It has a smell. And those who have been through trauma or emergency can tell you that. In the critical heightened moments that were physically vulnerable, time slows down, details and vision become clearer, endorphins kick in, the real becomes surreal. And scientifically, I'll remind you that this is so to aid us in our fight, to help us to perform better, to be able to run faster from our foe. We are animals after all. We are physical, physical and lasting, we are embodied. And so this focus on demeanor is important. Spiritually speaking though, I will add that these moments of clarity are also aided by spirits, by a cloud of witnesses, <laughs> by saints that guide us in our struggles. And in these places where we suffer, God is nearer and closer at hand. You know it. I know it. We have real and tangible experience of this, many of us, and it speaks to that emotion or the faith piece that is such a part of the psalm. It's from this more spiritual perspective that we can enter into a mystical belief in God's capacity to judge to change all of eternity and to bend the very reason that we try to live upon is we choose to behave righteously and avoid evil. So perhaps the key lies not in changing what we physically experience or trusting that those who hate and harm us will be damned. Maybe instead it's about what we pay attention to in the moment that it's happening. Maybe it's not about salvation or damnation. Maybe it's not about righteous or wicked. Maybe it's not about giving thanks or leaning into instruction. Maybe it's about what happens in the very moment of catastrophic, life-altering circumstance. As our stress level rises and the adrenaline takes over our senses and they become sharper, what is it that we notice? Do we become angry at our predicament, or do we feel strong in the knowledge that things will be resolved? Do we see the beauty unfolding, or do we judge the way that things are being handled? And for most of the seniors, let's not ask what they're focused on. I suspect it is not the beauty of the unfolding. <laughs> so on the front of your page is a painting. And this is what Auden was writing about. He actually wrote this poem in a museum with another painting. And the bottom half of the poem is this one. And what he says, if you'll see in the foreground, there is a farmer plowing. And in the back, there's a big ship. And right in between them in the green water, you can see two legs flailing out of the water. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from disaster. The plowman might have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, 
and the extensive delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. This isn't about whether God will save or damn him. Well, maybe it is for him. <laughs> he is at first drowning. <laughs> But I will deign to tell you that it doesn't matter which thing David was trying to emphasize and which translation we choose or what the theme of the psalm is, really, because what it comes down to is that this polarity is authentic and poignant and real in a way that might have been accidental or it might have been the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is the same way we all arrived here, isn't it, in the church and ministry at the seminary? accidentally and with great polarity when things are shifting we uniquely have a foot in two spaces two different ways of being and we feel and see two different kinds of ways we are faithfully trusting and we are also suffering there is great grief and change and there is hope in the future there is the knowledge of the fact that we're waiting for the world to change. And seminarians are uniquely poised to understand the space between this physical and mental, mental conundrum that's brought on by David's story in Psalm 34. We can attest to this lost in translation conundrum as if it's truth. Because we live it every day. We are drawn to the tradition, but we also yearn for new life in the church. Seminarians are caught one foot knowing deeply our faith and the other finding ourselves in a brand new embodiment of it. We arrive here on the precipice of a church haunted by an unholy past, but with the promise of a future without racism, beyond pandemic, one that affirms all people. We see the sin, and we know that the old life must fall away. And we are here for the new life, to create the way forward. We believe the same is true for the church. We see Icarus flailing, and we see life continuing on around him. And we uniquely stand in the tension created by the understanding of his suffering and by no one responding to it. We see it. We feel it. We witness it. I don't know if you've noticed, but there might be a seminarian on the shore right there. We will see that Icarus' story is told to the farmer, and we will let the boat sail on. And may we not choose between the damnation or the salvation for any of them, <clears throat> but know instead that God's place in our lives in the holding of all of that in play at the same time because our duty is to the exquisite beauty of all that that is. Amen. Diciendo, Señor, ten piedad. Por la Santa Iglesia de Dios, para que, para que esté llena de verdad y amor, y se haya sin mancha en el día de tu venida. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, ten piedad. Por la visión de la Iglesia, para que en testimonio fiel proclame el Evangelio hasta los confines de la tierra. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, bendiga. Por la paz del mundo, para que entre las naciones y los pueblos crezca el espíritu de respeto y comprensión. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, bendiga. 
por los que tienen cargos de responsabilidad pública para que sirvan a la justicia y promuevan la dignidad y la libertad de toda persona. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, Señor. Por todos los estudiantes en esta comunidad, especialmente Anthony y Antonia, te rogamos, Señor. Señor, Señor, Señor. Por todos que trabajan en esta comunidad, especialmente Marcos, te rogamos, oh Señor. Señor, Señor. Por los pobres, los perseguidos, los enfermos y todos cuantos sufren, por los refugiados, los prisioneros y por todos los que están en peligro, para que haya alivio y protección. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, Señor. Por todos los que se han encomendado a nuestras oraciones, especialmente Lindsay, James, David, Liz, Stacy, David, Patsy, Healing for Dusty, the Dodgins family, and for Ukraine. Por nuestras familias, amigos y vecinos, para que libres de ansiedad vivan en gozo, paz y salud. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, Señor. Por cuantos han muerto en la comunión de tu iglesia, especialmente Zelma, y por aquellos cuya fe solo tú conoces, para que con todos tus santos tengan descanso en ese lugar donde no hay dolor ni tristeza, sino vida interna. Te suplicamos, Señor. Señor, Señor. Rodándonos en la comunión de todos los santos, encomendemos los unos a los otros y toda nuestra vida a Cristo nuestro Dios. A ti, a ti Señor, Señor Dios. nuestro Dios. Porque tuyo es la majestad, Padre, Hijo y Espíritu Santo. Tuyo es el reino y el poder y la gloria, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Amén. Amén en amor, como Jesucristo nos amó y se entregó a sí mismo como un sacrificio y bendición para nuestra vida. Amén.
Arriba los corazones. Damos las gracias al Señor nuestro Dios. El verdadero justo y necesario, en todo tiempo y lugar, darte gracias, Padre de todo poder, Creador del cielo y tierra. Por tanto, te alabamos, uniendo nuestras voces con ángeles, arcángeles y todos los coros celestiales, que por siempre cantan este himno para proclamar la gloria de Dios. Dios y Padre de todos y todas. Sobre la cruz, Jesús extendió sus brazos y obedeciendo tu voluntad, se ofreció como sacrificio perfecto para el mundo entero. En la noche en que le entregaron al sufrimiento y a la muerte, nuestro Señor Jesucristo tomó pan. Y la de gracias lo partió y lo dio a sus discípulos y dijo, tomen y coman. Este es mi cuerpo entregado por ustedes. Hagan esto por el memorial de Dios. Después de la cena, tomó el vino. Después de ofrecerte gracias, se lo dio y dijo, beban todos. Este es, esta es mi sangre del nuevo pacto, que por ustedes y por todos se derrama para el perdón de los pecados. Cada vez que lo dejan, hagan esto en memoria de Dios. Por tanto, proclamamos el misterio de la fe. Cristo ha muerto, Cristo ha resucitado, Cristo volverá. Mediante este sacrificio y acción de gracias, Padre nuestro, celebramos nuestra liberación. Y recordando que Cristo murió, resucitó y subió al cielo, te ofrecemos estos dones. Santifícalos por tu Espíritu, que sean para tu pueblo el cuerpo y la sangre de tu Hijo la santa comida y bebida de la vida nueva y sin fin que tenemos en mí. Santificamos también, para que fielmente recibamos este santo sacramento y te sirvamos firmes, unidos y en paz, y en el día final, llévanos con todo tu pueblo santo al gozo de tu reino eterno. Todo esto te pedimos por tu Hijo Jesucristo, por él, con él y en él. En la unidad del Espíritu Santo, tuyo son el honor y la gloria, Padre y Potente, ahora y por siempre. Amén. Siguiendo la enseñanza de nuestro Salvador, oremos cantando juntos.
Cristo nuestra Pascua se ha sacrificado por nosotros. Celebremos la fiesta. Amen. 
Oremos. Dios eterno, Padre de la Universidad, en tu gracia nos has presentado con los que nos has hecho en este tiempo y nos has hecho en este tiempo. Y nos has hecho en este tiempo con mi vida sexual, en el desarrollo de tu cuerpo, 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 en el desarrollo de tu cuerpo. ahora y por siempre. Amén. Vayamos en paz para amar y servir al Señor. Y a Dios. Gracias a Dios.